Great. Uh, thanks, Nick. Um, I should acknowledge my co-authors in particular. This was the uh, PhD work of Henry Tan at Georgetown, who I mistakenly let graduate. Um, and so he's, he's not here today. Um, so uh, towards this thing, you can use it to get anonymity. OK. Um, in particular, uh, this paper is really about traffic correlation attacks. And there are different types of traffic correlation attacks. But the type of traffic correlation attack that, that I care about uh, in this talk is an adversary who can see traffic entering this black box because Tor is perfect, uh, Tor network, and look at the traffic coming out, and then use things like packet counting and uh, excuse me, timing analysis to match inputs and outputs. So if the adversary is able to be on both the ingress side of traffic going into the network and um, the traffic going out of the network, the egress side, it can do math and statistics and have a pretty good idea of uh, who's talking to whom and, and break anonymity. And this is a, a, a well-known established result. Um, I'm mostly going to be talking uh, in, in this talk about the uh, ingress traffic. Uh, you can think of this as the uh, adversary trying to enumerate the number of or the, the people who are using Tor. Um, the entire paper is kind of there's a symmetric argument for the egress, uh, which we don't really go into. Traffic correlation has been examined a lot uh, before. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, really great papers on this that. that uh, show how to uh, do this. Um, Stephen has a good one that shows how to do this really efficiently. Um, most of the prior work, with um, some notable exceptions, uh, uh, Pratik's work and uh, uh, Raptor being a, a very notable exception, but most of the prior work in this area assumes a static internet. So they do things, and I'm very guilty of this, uh, where they take Tor as it is you know, at some point in time, freeze a map, and then look at um, uh, do some analysis based on that frozen map and say, okay, Tor's security is X. Uh, but on reality, uh, Tor runs on, on the internet, uh, which means that when you're looking at these traffic analysis uh, or correlation attacks, you need to consider the fact that there are a number of ASs, autonomous systems, between the client and the guard, and the forward path and the reverse path need not and often are not uh, symmetric. This leaves an adversary who's not on that path uh, in a very unfortunate uh, position. Uh, this is a sad adversary who really wants to enumerate who the client is, but it's not on the ingress path. This entire paper is about doing this, which is that the adversary attacks BGP or um, does some BGP manipulation of the Internet's control plane to cause traffic to be routed either in the forward or reverse direction, doesn't really matter, from th the client to the adversary, to the guard, or, or the other way around. And at this point, the adversary becomes happy because it can figure out who's do, who the client is. So the goals in this work are to understand how attacks against the Internet's control plane network affects Tor, and to develop defenses uh, for Tor that operate only at the data plane. We assume that Tor wants to actually use this technique and um, isn't um, uh, going to receive a lot of cooperation, or the relays are not operated by autonomous systems that are operated by volunteers. Who's our adversary? Our adversary is a network adversary that operates an autonomous system or has compromised one. Uh, its goal is, again, to be on the ingress path. We're not, not targeting specific users. The goal of the adversary is to de-anonymize as much of Tor as, as possible. So what it's going to do is target the highest bandwidth guard relays, the ones that Tor selects most often, or that Tor clients select most often. It also wants to stay undetected. It doesn't want to uh, be in the news. So this limits the number of control plane attacks that it's willing to do. Because as, we'll, as I'll talk about later, launching one of these attacks is not side effects free. There are side effects. There, are there is collateral damage. We don't want our defenses to depend on the control plane. And we don't want to rely on centralized monitoring. As a brief primer on uh, BGP, BGP is this protocol. It's not very secure. It's uh, old-ish. Um, and it's used for autonomous systems to exchange routing information so that the internet can just work. Um, it looks like this. You have a, uh, it's in CIDR notation. So you have a uh, IP address range and then a path. I guess you can't see that too well, which is uh, ASN numbers. Um, and this is propagated. It's uh, mostly a path vector protocol with, with some asterisks there. Uh, blocks that are more specific than slash 24, that are smaller than tw slash 24, 
uh, typically aren't propagated. So you can't do an attack against a specific IP address. You can't do a slash 32, for example. And that's where you have this collateral damage that I'll talk about later. How does uh, routing logic work? Um, well, so at border routers, the next hop is ba has to be based on the longest prefix match, the most specific um, compatible uh, path. In case of ties, then business logic, uh, MBAs get to decide how this is done. Typically, this is done by preferring customers over peers, over providers, because money is good. Uh, in the case of a tie, ASs tend to prefer shortest paths over longer paths. Last bit of background, this idea of longest prefix, prefix routing allows for a longest prefix hijacking attack, which is basically I announce if YouTube has a slash 23 and I take their IP address and I announce a slash 24, because I'm more specific, everybody is going to come to me, and this has happened uh, in the past uh, uh, with, with YouTube. Tor is, uh, as others have noted, is vulnerable to longest prefix hijacking attack. And again, the adversary's goal is to be on the ingress path. So what the adversary do does is to sort the guard relays by their selection probability. This in inf information is public. And then for each relay whose IP address is covered in something that's um, shorter than a slash 24, it attacks. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Okay. Um, the overall, so the first thing we looked at is the overall vulnerability of Tor guards to the longest prefix hijacking attack. The more interesting um, axis here is the second y axis, which is the advertised bandwidth is a fraction of uh, Tor bandwidth. And we find that actually we were very surprised by this. 92% uh, 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 of Tor guard bandwidth belongs to routers whose IP addresses are covered in prefixes shorter than slash 24. In other words, 92% of guard bandwidth is vulnerable. Now, that said, there's several important caveats. I'll list one. Uh, you probably don't want to launch 4,000 BGP attacks. That would definitely get you caught. But also, um, black holing, in other words, making doing denial of service against these guards is very easy. To do man in the middle, which or at least eavesdrop, and then continue, continue that on to go to the guard so the guard traffic is actually used, which is what our adversary is trying to do, is, is harder to do, and it the adversary's ability to do that depends on its actual network location. Um, so one thing that we did in this work is we built a map of the live Tor network. We did this by taking trace routes from CADA, which is a great service, it's distributed vantage points of the internet, and weaving them, to, like kind of st stitching these things together. Um, and we verified it using um, RIPE and um, some other different sources to show that this generally is an accurate map. Um, and then what we did is we considered adversaries who were willing to launch a few attacks against, uh, a few BGP attacks against Tor, from anywhere from uh, one to six attacks, and look at, for all ASs on the internet, what is the increase in Tor traffic it's allowed to see. So this is across all possible ASs on the internet. Uh, you notice that w without attack, um, the median or the average, if you will, AS can't see any um, client or guard traffic. The bars here are the range from the best case to the worst case. Um, but with uh, only six attacks, the um, you know your average Joe autonomous system can see 13% of client to guard traffic. So that's that's an increase of about 13%. Uh, we also looked at uh, shortest path attacks. Uh, I'm not going to really go into the details um, because the t time is short. But there's plenty of details in the paper. Um, what we found is uh, shortest path attacks are more localized. They only affect a smaller group of, uh, of relays and clients. Um, these red bars here, which is mostly at zero, it's log scale, so you can't see it, uh, show that before the attack, pretty much very few of the ASs were actually able to launch this attack and see any, sorry, not launch an attack, but see, happen by circumstance, by happenstance, to um, be on the, the ingress path. But by launching the attack, you get uh, this curve, um, which shows you know, you're able to get not a, a huge amount of Tor uh, bandwidth by launching these attacks, but, but more than zero. And we broke this down by type of autonomous system. So um, the second half of our paper is to look at defenses. Uh, what can Tor uh, do about this if it cares to do anything about it? Um, and the high-level approach uh, is as follows. 
So uh, what guards are going to do, or they're going to use trace routes, and trace routes I know are vulnerable, and we'll talk about this vulnerability, or I'll talk about this vulnerability in a bit. But they perform trace routes to discover their one hop AS neighborhood, and they um, uh, attest to that neighborhood by including it in Tor descriptors, which are then going to, we're gonna leverage Tor's existing PKI, if you will, um, so that clients can authenticate that information. We, we're introducing these um, quasi-trusted CPA nodes. They're, these are kind of special Tor clients uh, which ass assess the trustworthiness of routes to guards. And these assessments are going to be published uh, in Tor directories. And um, based on their assessments, we're going to assign guards to either have a safe, safeguard flag, in which case clients will decide to use them, or not, not have the safeguard flag, in which case clients should avoid their use. Okay, so these uh, CPAs, uh, their job is to assess the quality of the AS level path to a guard. Uh, we use three techniques. Um, the subpath property was proposed elsewhere. We were borrowing from that. Uh, we found that it is uh, insufficient and vulnerable to manipulation. So the two, the hop count and the relay, relay neighbor AS discovery protocols are ones that we've used to boost the security of the subpath property. What is a subpath property? Um, it, it says that if there's an AS path uh, from uh, AS A to B, and that path is X1, X2 to Xn, then the path from A to Xi is X1, X2 up to Xi minus one. We did some measurements on the internet to confirm that this generally does hold, hold true. So the subpath property, and if you think about how BGP works, this makes sense that, it, that you would see this most of the time. Um, so how does the subpath property work as a defense against routing uh, BGP manipulation? Uh, so suppose that, um, can you read any of this? I don't know. That uh, this node is, this AS is malicious and the default path goes this way. Uh, because it's malicious, it launches an attack that, that causes traffic to this uh, guard to go down the, the southern route. If you do a trace route, if the, the CPA does a trace route to the guard, it's going to get back um, this path here. But then if it does a, sub, uh, a trace route to the penultimate, the, the AS before the guard, it's going to get this path, which is not a subpath. Now, why does that happen? It gets this path, the, the northern path, because the adversary is just attacking uh, this prefix that belongs to the, the guard, right? The, BGP attacks are specific and only affect the uh, announced CIDR, or in this case, um, this block of IP addresses. So by taking um, parts of the subpath, or of the returned AS path, and doing trace routes to those, you can discover discrepancies. This is, works fine as long as the adversary doesn't know you're doing this. Um, trace routes can be forged, and this falls apart and offers no security in the uh, face of an informed uh, attacker. So the goals of our new defenses are to make this type of tra trace route manipulation much more difficult and the subpath property check more robust. Um, one thing that the, the guard can do, as I mentioned before, is it can discover their AS neighborhoods and post them to Tor directories. And uh, this limits the lies that the adversary can tell about its fictitious awesome path to the Tor guard relays. And in other words, in other words, it requires the adversary to also be in the path to the guard's neighbors. Um, and in our attack model, the adversary isn't able to physically move. It can only launch uh, uh, virtual attacks uh, using uh, BGP. Uh, as a second defense mechanism, we consider AS path length. Now it's not the case that paths on the internet are symmetric. A lot of the time they're not. But one observation that we made through some empirical measurements is that the hop count from Alice to Bob is approximately the same as from Bob to Alice. Uh, and we can use this heuristic to again discover routes that seem anom anomalous and use that to uh, raise some uh, concern. Uh, so to recap, the guard performs trace routes to discover its neighborhood. It uh, uses these uh, CPA nodes to assess the trustworthiness of guards and clients 
uh, only use the guards where um, some majority of the CPAs or some configurable fraction of the CPAs believe in the guards' trustworthiness. Does this thing work? Uh, it, it, it does, um, not perfectly. Uh, in the bottom with, um, actually I'll start at the top, with no defenses, um, using, this is the longest prefix matching attack uh, with attacking using six BGP attacks, um, you get about, for the different ASs, about 13% of guard traffic. Um, with uh, no attack, this is, you know, how much it's able to capture just by circumstance or happenstance of being in a particular place on the uh, internet. And with the defenses, we do better, so the delta between this line and this line, which looks great because I fiddled with the y-axis, uh, is the efficacy of um, our defense. Things I skipped, uh, the bandwidth overhead, it's small, churn resistance, uh, we're pretty resistant to churn, false positive rate, uh, we do kill about 2% of guards. Um, we, because of our false positives, we make 2% of the guards pretty much useless. Um, mitigating allergy attacks, so are we, by introducing this detection technique, enabling a type of denial of service, a new type of denial of service where you can kind of target a guard um, that you, you like um, and cause it not to be used? Um, we have some mitigations for that, uh, which are in the paper. So in summary, uh, security analyses of Tor should really consider network dynamics and not just view the internet as a static thing. Um, Tor is an overlay that operates on an underlay, so you really do need to consider the underlay. You need to consider what the internet is actually doing. The vulnerabilities on the internet and the internet's routing protocol do affect the security of the overlay. And it is possible to defend against some attacks even when relying only on the data plane. So with that, oh, thank you, and uh, take your questions.